بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم brothers and sisters the topic that I've been given today almost seems difficult to talk about narrative, abstraction, word choice amid the bombardment and death that we are viewing in Gaza today. How can we talk about words and concepts and stories when people are losing their lives, when they don't have electricity, when they can't even bury their dead? But I would submit to you that the carnage that we are seeing today is the sharp end of a long spear made possible by the narrative that we must dismantle. It's a narrative that cost a six-year-old Palestinian-American child in Chicago his life when his 71-year-old landlord, who used to play with him, stabbed him 26 times and injured his mother while spewing death to Palestinians. By his own admission, his murderer became obsessed with the news coverage of the situation in Gaza. And it was this consumption of a toxic media that drove him to this horrific crime. Wadia Al-Fayyumi's final words after being stabbed 26 times were, Mama, I'm fine. And in the same way, Palestinians in Gaza send voice notes to comfort and reassure us, us, warm in our beds. So we cannot despair even as Western democracies criminalize our dissent, shadow ban our social media, label and put us on lists and publish our home addresses, endangering our families just for speaking out. Some risk their livelihood by speaking out. So yes, the risk is real for many, but the risk we face for speaking the truth is minuscule compared to those of our siblings in Palestine. We still must use our voices to offer a different narrative. And we know that speaking truth to tyranny is the best jihad. And this is not just another struggle. This is Al-Aqsa. This is our holy land, the first Qibla, the second masjid on earth, the furthest, the furthest mosque, the land of gathering, the land of resurrection, the gateways to the heavens. First, we must understand that competing narratives are not only between East and West, but within each community. Don't assume everyone in the West thinks the same way, because they don't. So what I'd like to use my platform today is to offer practical messaging advice to advocate for Palestine to address persuadable Westerners. There are essentially three groups, if you want to break it down to this. People who are already pro-Palestinian. In the US, that's about 10%. People who are on the fence, that's about 25%. And then the rest who say that they are more sympathetic to Israel. What I find so amazing is that support for Israel in the United States, and this will surprise many of you, has actually increased since October 7th. And that just shows you the power of narrative. 
So we have to speak to people in a language they understand. Understanding where they're coming from, understanding their point of departure. We also have to know that anti-Palestinian or pro-Israeli rhetoric is steeped in Islamophobia. When you analyze the kinds of tropes, the kinds of caricatures that are being mobilized today, they are every anti-Muslim stereotype of savagery, of terrorism, of violence. So we have to understand that pro-Israeli rhetoric is not separate from Islamophobia. That in fact, Islamophobia is not a separate phenomena at all. It is quite literally the handmaiden of anti-Palestinian rhetoric. And this becomes very clear when you follow the dollars. When you look at the Islamophobia industry and find, according to one study, that 80% of the money that funds it can be tied back to the state of Israel. We also have to understand that not everyone is as easily persuadable. So in America, one-fourth of Americans are evangelical. Many of them support Israel as a matter of sincerely held beliefs. Though younger evangelicals are less likely than their elders to hold this view and can be engaged, I would recommend that you focus your energy on the movable middle that is not religiously bound to Zionism. And that is most Westerners. Most Westerners are not religiously bound to Zionism. So as we have been taught in our faith, speak to people according to their understanding. In other words, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. So how do we advocate if we want to win more people to the side of Palestinian liberation? And what I'm about to present to you, these recommendations, are the result of my study of the pro-Israeli messaging playbook, which was leaked and sent to me by a friend. I studied this messaging, this, essentially this messaging uh, document very carefully, and it was from that, uh, from that study, from that document, which was very well researched in terms of the kinds of words to use, what messages work with American audiences and Western audiences in general and which don't. It was based on studying the other side's messaging document that I came up with the following recommendations. The first one is very simple. We have to start with empathy for the common humanity of all. If you're not perceived to care about everyone's well-being and everyone's safety, you will lose your audience. Start with what is actually true to our faith, which is concern and empathy for common humanity. Next, establish common values. Palestinians want what we all want, safety, freedom, a better future for their families. Third, and this is important, emphasize how different Israel is from the US and Europe. Unlike the US, where we believe in equality regardless of religion, in Israel, the law is written to literally have two classes of humans. One set of rights for Jewish Israelis and another for Muslims and Christians. In every aspect of life, from the job you can have to the home you can own, these are different depending on your faith. Imagine. If this is the case for Israeli citizens of different faiths, imagine how occupied people are treated. So one of the key points 
in this messaging document is to talk about how similar Israel to the US and Europe. And of course, that's actually not even true. The fourth thing I'd recommend is to speak to young people and keep using social media. I'm going to share with you one statistic that really surprised me. In a recent poll, it found that 85%, 85% of 65-year-old and above Americans support Israel. That number among 18 to 34-year-olds is 26%. Now, what is the difference between these two age groups? And the answer is where they get their news. The ones to 18 to 34 years old, where only 20, only roughly a quarter support Israel, are getting their news mostly from social media. So the posts that you're doing, the messages that you're putting out through your social media matter and you should keep doing so. Understand who is the most receptive audience to your message, and it is young people. Next, never, and I emphasize, never fall into anti-Semitism in your advocacy for Palestine. First, because it's immoral and against our faith, anti-Semitism is a, uh, a phenomenon of the West. It was originated in the West, and it's not something part of our tradition at all. And second, because it's very ineffective. Never generalize and say, quote, the Jews. First, because many Jews are very strong allies to Palestine, and second, because it totally discredits you. Differentiate, in fact, between the Israeli government and its people. Say that Israelis deserve a responsible government that won't kill children in their name. Next, consider the hierarchy of needs. Israel talks about security. The most basic human need that exists is security. If we were worried about this ceiling falling on us, no one would be listening to me. So security is the most basic human need. We, on the other hand, talk about things like self-determination and freedom. These are very high order needs. So we say free Palestine. It's beautiful. It's inspiring to us, but it's very abstract. And it's the highest order need, self-actualization, freedom, versus the lowest, most basic need, security, having the right to defend yourself. Yet Palestinians are completely deprived of safety. Palestinians have a right to defend themselves as well. We need to talk much more about Palestinian security. It can never become a dichotomy between Israeli security and Palestinian autonomy. We will lose every time. We need to discuss and emphasize the lack of Palestinian security. You gain credibility by conceding a point. Concede that no one is perfect. Yes, in their desperate attempt to secure their families from daily aggression, Palestinians make mistakes. This, bell, this actually builds credibility. Refuse to defend or condemn Hamas. Since you and I are not responsible for them, in fact, take righteous offense at being asked. If you're questioning if the killing of children offends me because of my ethnicity and religion, then it is you who owes me an apology. You can condemn in principle the targeting of non-combatants, but here's the bottom line, and this is especially for Westerners. I don't fund Hamas. They don't answer to me. You and I do, as Americans at least, fund the IDF in the order of billions of US dollars. They should answer to us. Focus on the children. 
Gaza is an open-air prison that has become an open-air children's graveyard. Focus on the harm of violence, even to the goals or the so-called stated goals of Israel. When has violence worked against Hamas? while it destroys the already unlivable lives of innocent Palestinians. Speak in terms of needing equality. Westerners, Western audiences understand equality. So educate them on how unequal the situation is. Emphasize, this is very important, how asymmetrical the situation is. This is in terms of military capability, resources, especially in terms of body count and children killed. The other side wants to make it about a conflict. When we talk, why, does it, why is it called a war when it's actually a genocide? Why do we call it a conflict when, it's, when it implies two equal sides fighting each other, and it's anything but. It is, what, it, what they don't want it to look like is a, a, a matter of a David and Goliath type situation. And so you must emphasize that that is in fact what it is. That there is asymmetry in power, asymmetry in resources. This is not two equal sides fighting each other like uh, the Cold War or something. Focus on the future and what that will look like if we succeed. Now, this is difficult because many of us want to talk about the past. We want to educate Western audiences about the past. And if you have the time, if you're giving a lecture at a university, go right ahead. But if you're left with a talking point or a tweet, talking about the past will not work. Western audiences simply don't think in terms of the past. They gravitate to the one who has the most inspiring vision of the future. They want to see progress. So de describe what a future, if we succeed, would look like. Something like a prosperous Palestine, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian children playing safely together as equals, focus on the future and on how it's so different from the present. Emphasize the dissent of even Western government officials. So for example, this just happened, Josh Paul, who spent a decade in the, in the US State Department's bureau overseeing arms sales. He's the guy in charge of getting weapons to Israel. He just resigned over the Biden administration's Gaza policy. These are powerful examples of the moral bankruptcy of the policy, where even internal officials are resigning. And my last recommendation to you today is this. Western audiences want to be inspired not just to pity a group. And that's why we hear so much about technology unicorns and the, uh, the entrepreneurs in Israel. They want a team to root for. They want to be on the side of people who are, quote, successful and smart and innovative. So give people a team to root for in Palestine. Talk about common humanity. Palestinian accomplishments and cultural contributions. There is a reason we all hear about Hamas being Israeli. This is not like all just like a coincidence. The idea of appropriating Palestinian culture is very deliberate. Don't allow it to happen. Palestinians aren't just victims. They are survivors. Despite the neck-breaking oppression Palestinians are entrepreneurs. They are brave survivors of oppression and occupation and daily murder. 
and yet still have phenomenal businesses and tech startups and their artists and their poets and their phenomenal artisans. They won't allow the situation and the oppression to rob them of their humanity. Talk about Palestinian humanity and ingenuity. So in summary, start with empathy for our common humanity, our common human needs of safety first and then justice, and then call for an end to apartheid. As uneven as the resources, the most valuable resource of all is on our side, and that is the truth. Let us present it to the world. Thank you. Uh -huh.